Thank you very much, Abigail, and a warm welcome to all our attendants today, and uh, uh, a big thank you to our speakers and panelists. So as Abigail said, my name is Silvia lopez Ekra, and I am the Deputy Director of the UN Food Systems Coordination Hub. Abigail also mentioned that today is our first uh, webinar because we have had uh, the habit of organizing monthly meetings with our national conveners to give you a little bit of background after the UN Food Systems Summit in 2021, the UN Food Systems Coordination Hub was created to make sure that we um, continue to mobilize the ecosystem of support for a robust follow-up of the summit. And national conveners on food systems, who are the officials that have been de designated in uh, most countries to follow up on the summit, uh, have been engaged by the hub on a regular basis uh, with monthly dialogues where we are discussing thematic issues that are very dear to the food systems transformation agenda. But one request that we have received on, on uh, repeated occasions was to open up those conversations to other practitioners. And of course, for the hub, uh, our mission being to mobilize the full ecosystem of support, the recognitions that stakeholders have an important role to play, we obviously had to respond to that demand and create a new set of uh, moments together. And uh, the webinars uh, is the response to that. So we'll continue to have the dialogues on a monthly basis, and we will also organize webinars at regular intervals. So this one is the first one on standards and labels. This year is extremely important for all the food systems community, because this is the moment that we are coming back together two years after the summit. And this year, we are focusing on implementation. Yesterday, the Deputy Secretary General uh, of the UN organized a briefing in New York that was followed live by uh, member states also in Geneva and in Rome to discuss the stock taking moment that is going to take place this year uh, in July in, in Rome, uh, thanks to the generous offer of our Italian counterparts to host this moment. So it is the most critical moment for food systems actors. It's going to feed directly into the SDG summit. And uh, the conversation that we are going to have today is also going to inform our thinking and our understanding of the importance of standards and labels. So as part of those preparations uh, for the stock taking moment, we have organized five regional meetings. Um, in the different regions, we had more than 400 participants physically with us in the different regions, more than 400 uh, also connected online. And one of the elements that really came through is that if we are to do, to do food systems uh, transformation properly, we have to look at production, but also at consumption and food loss and waste and to put the consumer and health and nutrition at the center. And I think with standards and labels, uh, this is what really what we are trying to do and trying to achieve. And it's an important tool in our baskets to make sure that we uh, generate the best outcomes when it comes to health, to nutrition, and to safety for uh, consumers, citizens, and, and the SDGs agenda at large. So we're very happy to have with us uh, a panel of experts. Uh, I am definitely not one of them, so look forward to be learning along with you today and really to listen to uh, your insights and your experience about the collaboration that should take place with uh, member states, with countries, with stakeholders, with the private sector, with consumers about uh, food uh, standards and labels. We'll have one hour together and uh, we will be introducing to the topic by a keynote speaker. And it is my honor and privilege to introduce her. And then I will be handing over the moderation to the very capable ends of my colleague, Nicole De Pola, who is online. So let me now introduce our keynote speaker, Mrs. Renate Kunast. She's a German politician, lawyer, and social worker. She has been a member of the German Bundestag since 2002, and she lives in, in Berlin, which is where she is connecting from this morning. From 2001 to 2005, she was Minister for Consumer Protection, Food and Agriculture. 
from 2015 to 2017, she was the chair of the Committee on Legal Affairs and Consumer Protection. And in the current 20th legislative period, she is the spokesperson for agriculture and food of the Alliance 90, the Greens Party parliamentary group, a member of the Committee on Food and Agriculture, and also a member of the Legal Affairs Committee. This is a very condensed uh, bio for someone who really has a strong track record when it comes to consumer protection and consumer and food systems transformation. So my colleagues are going to put the full bio in the chat, but it, it is really my privilege and we are delighting to welcome you. And I'm now ending the floor to you, Renate. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much uh, for the invitation because um, I'm happy to be invited on, on, um, on this because I'm always busy in systematic approaches. You see, um, you introduced me and, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to, to give you some ideas of a systematic approach to change food systems. And um, you see, sometimes even in Germany, as we still have the debate when people say, okay, this is important, so let's make to 1 million or 2 million and finance some model projects. This drives me a bit crazy. So I always think, okay, this, these are these people that are very busy and have a lot of empathy for something. They should get some money. But on the other hand, I'm always looking for the systematic approach, which means it's not only to, to finance some people that are on the right way. The point is to empower a system. Sometimes I do say I have to multiply myself or multiply an idea, which means if you change structures and implement some tools, a lot of other people are able to organize a change. And you see, this is what I, I would like to talk about uh, in the 10, 15 minutes. In this uh, webinar, I don't have to explain the sustainable development goals, the hunger and all the things. We don't have to discuss about reducing pesticide, which is good for nature, for health, for planetary health, health of the people there. And we all know that, um, that uh, a lot of scientists um, in the, this uh, paper that is written more than 10 years ago by a lot of uh, scientists on the agriculture sector, how, the, how agriculture should be. Uh, looking at all the crises from hunger to climate crisis and so water problems. This more than 150 agricultural persons said, um, we have to change the way we do agriculture. The solution is not industrial agriculture as business as usual, but uh, to, to change the food systems and be more and more organic. Organic does not only mean be certified organic, but follow the regenerational system or practice agroecology and you see a lot of time a lot of time people think okay finance here or there i always say there is no single tool there is no single uh, model project or 10 model project there is no silver bullet but you need a systematic approach it's like the toolbox if you have someone trying to repair your house or so they will never come with just one tool. They always have a whole toolbox due to be prepared to the different problems. What are the tools we have? Um, a lot of them. We have, um, for example, um, the point subsidies. That are, these are different everywhere. Uh, some have them, some have less. In uh, you know, uh, European Union, we have the European Common Agricultural Policy which is about 40% of the money, of the budget. So of course, this is always a point where you have to drive for the change. We have research, education, uh, capacity building by individual uh, empowerment or empowerment of regions. We have um, uh, public procurement. If you want to, for example, uh, support uh, farmers or regional seasonal products, you can say public procurement will change it. This, this is in Germany, for example, this is billions by all the public canteens, by every mayor who, who because of um, a, a party in the or reception in the 
um, town hall, you know, he, he tries to look for some food. What kind of food is he looking for? Sometimes you have people say, yes, I'm so supportive for regional, for nature, for the regional farmers and the little ones. And if you look at the reception buffet, you see this is not true. We have rules for advertising, for example, is advertising telling the truth about animal husbandry or is it fair enough uh, due to children's health, obesity? We have legal standards uh, for, to support. We have labeling, which means um, do you have signs that make it easier for public procurement or um, for individual decision or for advertising or for gastro for, for hotels, tourism and so on to say, uh, we are more regional seasonal, we look at health and, and environment questions. So we only buy uh, products that have the minimum of this, not only legal standard, but of this labeling, which delivers more. And we have the debate on internalization of externalities. Um, you know, all these points. and. And as I already said, I'm always getting nervous and people just say, one of these tools, I use them, then everything is good. This is a, not a brilliant idea. I don't want to offer you uh, an idea how I'm trying to deal with question on organize a change because food systems change needs such a, a um, needs a holistic approach and and it needs um, some power because you will never change a system that was built up by a lot of lobbies and financial interests, not na only nationwide, but also global wide. You will not, we will not be able to change it in a short time. You see, we just have to use different tools and the reaction will be short, middle time, or even in a few years, but we need a systematic approach. Overall, the, the systematic approach means that we have to interest trade contracts. We have the WTO, which is more or less failing in two ways, because there are no decision made, because countries are struggling and fighting for the in, their interests. And the other point is that WTO uh, is just by benefit of some, you know, they organize the benefit of some, but uh, that they are not looking on uh, really fighting against hunger to and therefore support small farmers. Uh, they are not looking for environmental question, which is also support for farmers, but also for and climate question, but also for their health. Uh, the soil, good soil, you know, when you have erosion or no water is a problem. So this is overall. But now we have a lot of bilateral contracts. So I think one of the most important points is, and even in, you know, for countries, for regions, and for UN organizations, I think to raise the voice and say, and have a critical uh, view on, uh, on these trade, um, uh, on this uh, trade uh, contracts. We do have in Germany, for Europe, for example, we have the debate now on Mercosur. And the debate, for example, if, is, even if you implement good ideas, do you have sanctions? Do you have systems there? Do you have a control there? Because if every country says, yes, okay, we will focus on environmental question on the basic of, because this is climate and so on, uh, we'll try we'll protect tribes that are living there or small farmers. But if you don't have the tools around it, uh, a control, um, a system where you can say then we sanction or we have some reaction, then you are failing. This is a real big task, and I just wanted to mention it because for you always have to ask the the, the, the questions there: Is it fair? There we also have big industry trying to export, and for example, EU wants to export um, Mercosur have um, low level, lower level products. You know, the 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 chain is not so much developed, but but and so they also have an interest. But we all together should have the interest to focus on on the basis of life for everyone, people there, people there for climate and so on. And these contracts should not only be the big export interests, if it's car or if it's the big exporters of meat or uh, animal feed. We always have to focus on it. What does does it harm 
other people or does it protect people? So, but this is the big level. I want to give you three examples for uh, if you look at your region and, and your country. One of the oldest ones I did myself was uh, implementing a system for organic farming. Uh, in 2001, when I became minister, the point was I said that people were more and more interested in organic farming, even certified. I think in this round, I don't have to explain what are the what is the plus of this system. Um, and um, I started to, because um, there were a lot of different labels, I started with, uh, with organizing, um, developing a new label. This was the first point. Having a new label where there's written bio, and I, I, I did this new label so that it is easier to say, see, this is certified organic. You could organize this idea also with different things, animal husbandry or whatever, but I just want to focus on this. And I did the sign. I implemented it, gave information to uh, to tourism, to shops, and so on, and they could use it, uh, download it. We we uh, produced uh, signs for the shops so that you could see: are uh, here are the organic products. Uh, but that was not everything. We implemented this, and we did know that the packages and so on they minimum have it for three six weeks to three months. So the information campaign we started about three months later when we were sure that the first products with this sign were in the shelves. We combined this, you know, with a lot of advertising so that everyone knows it. Me as a minister, I'm running around looking here, producing so to, to create an awareness. But by the way, I also organized a organic federal program, which means for a few years, year by year, we put implemented some money and made and, and, you know, we Im implemented some tools there. For example, um, uh, how, where do we support universities to educate farmers, young people in how to farm in a certified way? We organized some money by all the subsidies we have for farming. We said, now we organize a bit more money for, for uh, changing your farm for the two years until you get certified, change the, give them some money because they are not certified. They, they have uh, less harvest, but can only sell as conventional. So we gave them some money for this period to give it a push. We did some more signs and, and said, okay, there are special science questions. We asked the farmers, what are your problems? What are your questions? So we, we took some of the existing money for science, even in public science institution, and say, you have to deal with these questions. Uh, we did a lot of courses and a lot of ideas. I cannot put them in here also. But the point is why I'm raising this. We are going on with this. We, are, we still develop this ongoing. For example, now, about 20 years later, we have, again, a green person who is... Um, agriculture minister now in Germany. And he now starts to make the sign more famous and known even and usable for restaurants, for example. Now we don't say, uh, so we, he's just changing the law that the restaurant must not be 100% certified and only, only use this, but there is a sign where you can write 50%. 50% of the products I buy from our restaurant are organic. So you you, you deal with there is not an, enough organic projects. On the other hand, this is a marketing tool, for, especially for younger people here. And so they go and ask the farmers, could you change? And then I have you'll have good contracts with me. You see it in the shops, even the big supermarket discounter in Germany, like Aldi, Lidl, and so on. They have big shelves with organic products. And the sign hubs and the support hubs and uh, we, for example, do also do a big program now for, um, how would I call it, to change all the canteens. If it's the kindergarten, schools, university, and so on. They, we, we try to support them, so we give some money for them when they want to change the food they get in their canteen. This is not only organic. This is also to do less meat, more uh, vegetables, more pulses. And we give them, I think, 35,000 uh, to, to get, um, how it's called, a training. There are special training institutions in Germany that help the, these to, to deliver different food by using the same money per, per menu. 
Uh, there they, you know, buy more vegetables, they learn how to cook again, not only, you know, have convenience there. And so we also have tried to move on a change. And there is also a question, if I look at universities, a lot of canteens and big universities do this change, for example. So this is not only a, a short trend, this is a change. And if, if you look at Fridays for Future or others, you will know that at the very end, we will not only discuss about energy change, we'll also discuss about agricultural and food change, like planetary health, which looks on the planet and individual health and also at the situation of the farmers. So this is, this is, um, the, these are a few parts of this. Um, even the, the, we try to change the food to go or the Christmas markets or so, have vegetable, vegan food, have, have organic food there. So this is an, an example for, to show you that you, you have to start with some tools and then go, got a broader a broader perspective as it is known and uses the civil society which is asking for this my the my second and third i'll do shorter my second example we have as a um, systematic approach to change is animal husbandry in germany you know we fought a lot long time for a more transparency in animal husbandry we don't know if the the uh, the cow or the pig was all her life in a stable closed door or if they ever have seen a sun or a green. So we start, we now in Germany start with the pig sector. Um, we are nearly nearly done in the next weeks we will be done and have it through the federal parliament with all stages. We are doing a labeling uh, and um, this is not, this is a um, you know, you are obliged to, we do a label, I don't know, is it mandatory or what is the word? We are. We will be obliged in Germany for the products here and others can use it if they want. We will be obliged, uh, forced to use a label for every kind of animal product. We start with the pig sector now and we developed a sign where you can see if your pig was, this pig meat was in the stable, a stable plus additional place. If it was some like a modern fresh air stable without walls outside, or if it wasn't running around on the green, or if it's even, which is the highest level, organic. We, what is the idea behind this? We want to support farmers and animal husbandry that has a higher stage of animal protection because they have have less animals on the same place and they have much more work. So we want to get transparency in the competition so that you cannot only say I'm coming on the region, out of the region, You, every consumer, if every restaurant will see what are the conditions. So we help them in the competition. And so we have created some criteria. So, and then everyone has to say in which group I am and that is the label you can use. But even on this, we know we want that more farmers are changing, that the consumers are able to make a decision. And I think there will be more decision-making for the higher level of animal husbandry. And there, there the people know why they pay a bit more. This is a point, but this is, also needs a toolbox. So we do this label. We uh, have legislative standards for this, but we will also change the law for um, the allowances for building a stable because now it's very close. So we we change the law so, law so that these people are able to build and don't have um, uh, um, legal problems with their in their area. To have this change, we we'll, we we'll start with pigs. We'll do it and and. In winter, we'll uh, do the first change of the law so that uh, even the restaurants have to use it. And we have a two years transition period. So we start with pigs, fresh meat. Then, then we do not only do the shops are obliged, then also the gastronomy of the restaurants although will be obliged. Next year, we will uh, make it broader with cows and chickens and so on. So that in the next three years, at the end of the next three years, we have the whole range for everything. Everyone has two years to up to two years time so that you can if you want to change your stable or build a new one then we have full transparency i think um this is good for the producers good for them we but we also for, for the consumers it's also good for animal protection and it will be a really a point of competition and we will um 
of course combine it. If we change, as I said, also the canteens and so on to have more organic food, less meat, more <clears throat> vegetables, then they also will, will be able to say we are more aware of what food is done with us or with the planet. And now I buy less meat, but I buy this uh, higher level. And I do not have to do a big of a lot of research and look myself at the stable at the farmer. I just have this labeling to make it easy going. We also do a um, regional sign. We we try because some of the farmers say yes, but then maybe people buy the bigger the the more the cheaper meat from somewhere else without any transparency. So we say we combine this package with with the regional. Um, sign, Herkunftszeichen, I don't know the English word, but you understand me, so that you can, for example, cook, if you live in Bavaria or Brandenburg, you can look where did the cow or the pig uh, grow up. And so we have the point. And my last point is, I think a lot of you will know, the last point on to, to say, to tell you about systematic approach to change systems. I want to focus you on Sikkim. Sikkim is one the the north uh, one of the north state between from India between Bhutan and Nepal. They decided much more than I think it's about twenty five years ago. The parliament decided to go organic, and they have if you look at this they have an impressive um, approach. They made the decision uh, fighting against against poverty going organic. So this is a federal state of India that is gone. I'm I'm ready in a minute. Say so I can't read, uh, and you see they have have done it the Son link. They they educated at university. They have regional products. They they educate the farmers, bring them together so that they know how to deal in the old way. They have better harvest now. They have was one or one and a half hectare. They have a good harvest to feed their family and even to sell. And they even support uh, organized systems to sell, and and. And this is, you know, this is an impressive point. I would say the only thing they, are, they need now, as they are discussing with Bhutan, Nepal, and some other northern states of India together to, to, to learn from each other for, from this, which could mean agroecology, not only really certified organic. Um, the, the last thing they need is to make a tra trademark Himalayas, like Himalaya, Sikkim, Himalaya, Nepal, or Dehradun, or whatever. But um, the, these are always the positions. Don't need use one tool, use um, the whole approach, the whole toolbox, and know that you it's not about decision making with one. You just have to look at on it on 10, 15 years. Sorry. In English, it's sometimes not so easy to be shorter. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Madame Kunest. It was uh, re only reflecting the passion that you put into this, the topic. And I think for all of us in the audience, it was extremely interesting to listen to you. Thank you so much for also uncovering and unearthing a little bit of the complexities and the need to really look at the bigger picture when we're discussing standards and, and, and labels, and also the importance of having this toolbox and not really trying to come at it from uh, one single entry point. And I really liked when you mentioned the, the public procurement, because this is an element that has also been raised by uh, some of our scientists working on the Global Sustainable Development Report that is going to be launched in uh, September during the SDG Summit. And the point that he was making, uh, this scientist from Senegal, but he's part of the 17, um, the group of, of 17 independent scientists was if you using and leveraging public procurement of food and looking at the entire chain and you're looking at daycare, you're looking at hospitals, you're looking at schools, you're looking at retirement houses, you're looking at prisons and all the public procurement around food uh, in those um, spaces, then you can really make a difference. And that's the huge leverage that we are not tapping into sufficiently. So thanks for making that point as well. And thanks for reminding us that food systems, uh, uh, a food systems approach and, and a systems approach is an imperative. It's not a luxury. We cannot continue to be fragmented and look at it from different bits and pieces and make the difference that we are looking at. And, and it was quite interesting to, to listen to you about the process of introducing a new label 
and everything that comes into it. Thank you very much for a, a fascinating uh, introduction to this webinar. Now I am handing over to Nicole to uh, moderate a quick Q&A and then introducing our panel. Nicole, over to you. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much. And hello, everybody. Uh, hello from Rome. So good morning for me, but I'm sure we have other different time zones. It was such a pleasure to start uh, this conversation with the strong, uh, strong examples. And this we are in the webinar uh, solutions. Uh, uh, and, and then I think we had a clear one. So I'm very thankful for that as well. And uh, so I'm Nicole Dupal. I'm the senior SDGs expert at the UN Food Systems Coordination Hub. It is my pleasure to have a few minutes uh, before I move on uh, to the second Second part of our conversation, I think, uh, Madam Kunist, you're going to have to leave us uh, before, I think, before the end of the, this, maybe there is a, 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 a voting system, but I can have maybe a one quick, uh, there is one uh, long comment here and a question. So we are three minutes behind, so we will pose these questions, but we have to keep it uh, short. So first question here we have for Dr. Hans Christoph Eiden, can the global system provide for a platform where national initiatives can be shared in order to learn more from others? And maybe how can we do the sphere learning globally? And then there is someone from uh, Pius Kube, sorry if I'm not pronouncing correctly. Uh, uh, the comment is, I live and work in a country and economy that is a net imported uh, of non-organic food products. So the little organic food products produced in my country is dwarfed by the imports and hardly make to the market. Uh, and then the question is, how can we solve this challenge? The vision is to transform our food systems and promote our organic food products and even embark on an export oriented agriculture system. So a little bit of this contradiction between the market pressures and the organic. And maybe if I can add a third aspect, you were mentioning of, of that the work, uh, the implementing a system for organic, for example, uh, it's still maybe a 20 years work. So how do we ensure this political sustainability, the leadership to continue this transformation, which as, as you um, fantastically noted, it's not an easy one and not a fast one. So if you can just, hard to reply uh, quickly, but uh, the floor is yours, Ms. Gunas. Thank you. I, I'd start with the last question. I could just say, I don't know, no, but that is a joke. To have the momentum for such a long time to do a change, it's very important to think about the first point, like having a label and implement it by make it, making it known somewhere. And uh, try to get regions where you um, where people really use it and are interested. One point I forgot, somewhere there we had problems with some residues and that was the point that the I think the most of the the organic uh, farmers uh, corporations in Germany put themselves together to a, a Bundes, uh, a federal union where they are all Bioland, Demeter and so on. They all put themselves together. I think this was one of the most important points because then you have a bigger voice compared to the traditional structures. You need this. And this is one of the key points. If you ever look at how people developed it and get broader and so, Cooperation is the point. In Germany, in Europe, we have a lot of uh, young people putting themselves together, Ernährungsräte, food, like a food NGO. They are looking at how do we feed ourselves, what is happening, what, are, what kind of problems do we use, and how do we get better food here? And they, they are dealing together. Together, you can always look what is the, the issue this year. It's not always the same. Where can I combine? Can I bind with star cooks or chef cooks or with kindergartens, whatever it is? Or do I combine with adipositas, obesity, to, to combine with the doctors and say, this is un, an unjust system. We have to do something. You're always on the food sector. And so you, you, you train yourself doing corporations and focus on this or that, but you always have the broad perspective. That is the point. And we can learn that every country is different in the the steps, but at the first point is visibility, you know, the, the, and I think uh, this is also a bit an answer to the, the question of the net importer of organic or so visibility and questioning, go there and ask why don't we have organic food, for example, but if you do it alone and somewhere it's wrong, build somehow a, a cooperation, you right know, and you can be shameless. Why shouldn't farmers combine themselves with children doctors, 
for example. And uh, every country has these possibilities, ideas, or maybe one member of a parliament with whom you can start a successful cooperation or, you know, um, an exchange of ideas and so. And Mr. Aiden, hello. <laughs> this this just, I think he puts a brilliant idea in my head because I think he was the one asking for the global system uh, we can provide to learn from this system. I think this is this is a good point. I know, for example, because I, I'm convinced our minister for international contacts to, to finance by his um, development aid, uh, the exchange in the Himalayas, as I mentioned, just to learn from Sikkim to free each other. You must not do exactly the same, but to learn from the systemic, systemic approach there and even to combine, because they could say, we need international help. You, you support the forest with money. We want to support the Himalayas because this is a water area. So this is a treasure of the whole mankind. And so if you want that, you have to support us farmers with some money or so. And but this question gives a new idea for me. Where is the point where you really could, you know, have an app or look and learn and get contacts to say, okay, this is close to me, I want to learn, or I want to export organic there, who, who, who I could ask. So we are, I think we're transitioning perfectly to this with new ideas and our, uh, I'm sure our guests are here also uh, very thankful for this comprehensive examples. Ms. Kunas, thank you so much. We are so honored to have you with us. And if you please, if you can stay a little longer, maybe at the end, we can have a final quick uh, final word. So let me move quickly to our uh, second part of a conversation because we have, uh, we continue to have amazing speakers today. Uh, I will go briefly again, if we can post, we're trying, I know that maybe the chat is not visible to us we're trying to fix but we will post the whole bios and i'll be short because i'm very pleased to have today uh with us is miss pilar santa coloma uh, who is a nutrition and food systems officer at the food and nutrition division at fio food and agriculture organization pilar you have over 18 years of experience as an agribusiness economist at fio and you're specializing in rural development inclusive markets public private alliances and quality management systems and social innovation thank you you're welcome uh, uh welcome um today with us second we have miss catherine engelhardt uh is a scientist with the world health organization's department of nutrition and food safety in geneva headquarters so where she leads the work of who guidelines on food environment policies including nutrition labeling policies and the development of uh, technical package of who acceleration plan to stop obesity the bios continue they're very long so apologies for making that short and, and and finally, we have with us Mr. Vittorio Fattori, who is a food safety officer at FIO, and he coordinates the foresight program on emerging food safety issues, provides scientific advice, and focuses on evaluating trends and drivers of change that impact food safety. So as you can see, we have indeed a very strong panel of experts uh, today. Uh, and I will go straight to the point. We're gonna try to have a two, three minutes um, response and maybe two rounds uh, in this conversation. And I would like to start uh, with Vitt Vittorio, now with the latest day. So I will start with you. First things first, I think we, we had so many examples, but maybe it would be still worth it to, to explain to our audience, and this is going to be also the resource uh, for others to watch, maybe people who are less experts. And I will be very curious, how are international standards developed and agreed? Uh, and more importantly, I think we mentioned already today, but what's the role of science in all of this? Because uh, the, the politics are also very high, but please uh, bring us this point for us, and I think it would be a very useful start. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Nicole, and, and, and a good day, uh, everyone. Yeah, no, I think this is very uh, important question. And I saw there was also a similar question on, on, on the chat about the role of FAO in, in, in setting standards. Um, I'd like to start off, but in food safety, we do have um, a body that is run jointly by FAO and WHO uh, that really sets the international framework for food safety governance. Um, it's the Codex Alimentarius Commission, uh, which some of you may be familiar with. It's a, it's a body that sets international standards on food safety based on some common ground, right? And the common ground that we try to achieve is the, is the science. So the scientific foundation that underpins the development of standards 
where countries can agree on developing, for example, uh, measures and provisions on issues like, for example, pesticide residues as opposed to food additives or residues of veterinary drugs in food. These are important uh, provisions because, of course, the codex standards are the international point of reference um, uh, at the WTO, the World Trade Organization. So if and when there is a dispute between countries on trade of food commodities, the benchmark standard that will be taken uh, as a point of reference in the dispute will be the Codex Alimentarius Commission standard. So those are very important. While they are voluntary in nature, they do act as um, a point of reference there. And, and to respond to, to, to the question, uh, Nicole, I think it is fundamental that on uh, some of these uh, discussions, there is, as I was mentioning, um, um, the basic foundation where we cannot objectively agree on, 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 on something. And this is, for example, the scientific foundation that we provide uh, together with WHO. We have a joint program that is called um, Scientific Advice Program, where we do provide risk assessment on many different food safety issues uh, from chemical hazard, microbiological, nutrition, and others. And these advice is then taken to inform uh, a policy making process that is based on evidence. So we are not basing on thin airs, we're basing on data, on information, and this is really where countries can contribute by providing information, providing data, and it's a very inclusive and transparent process, and I'll conclude there to say that countries, of course, engage in this uh, process by providing their, their, their contribution through the standard setting development of codex, even observers, NGOs, private sector can contribute and provide uh, their, their input. So it's a very inclusive and engaging process. It uh, sometimes can be lengthy, but it is the building the consensus that is needed for topic like this. And food is so close to our, our own daily life that we want to be, uh, have a process that is inclusive and transparent. Thank you. Fantastic, excellent, and we can objectively agree. Yes, right, because we know that we're not going to have time to so to go deeply on the trade uh, disputes. But I think definitely maybe our second conversation, a second webinar for us. Uh, thank you so much. So I would like to. I think it connects very well uh, with you, Catherine, because we know the healthy diets are an essential part of this uh, food systems transformation puzzle. Uh, we we talk about this every day. So. Uh, your work at WHO, could you bring this uh, into life to us and elaborate a little bit on this importance of the labeling for uh, healthier diets, how this is evolving and, and, and how important is this tool to achieve this goal? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Nicole, for, for the question. I think, I mean, an important point to start off with is that labeling is just one policy, which is part of a toolbox that um, the, the keynote speaker, um, Ms. Krinas, mentioned. So labeling is important, but it's just one part of, of the toolbox. I think what's important about labeling, though, um, it is the primary means of communication between the producers, the sellers on the one hand, and the purchasers, consumers on the other hand. So labeling is a very powerful policy instrument. But importantly, it's also a very busy policy space because there's so many interests, there's so many values that no package would actually be big enough to satisfy everyone's needs and, and wants. We heard of a couple already, organic, animal welfare, et cetera, but our focus um, is, is the nutrition, the health side and, and the food safety side. Um, so importantly, I think just to mention, uh, governments actually already regulate a lot of label types. For example, governments regulate allergen labeling. Producers comply with that, and consumers who are allergic, they know where to go to see because that, that can be life-threatening. So that's, that's always undisputed. But regulation of nutrition labels uh, and labeling is often not as straightforward. There are a number of labeling types when it comes to improving diets that all have different purposes. There are ingredient lists, nutrient declarations, front of pack labels, which are very popular and heavily debated now, but there are also nutrition and health claims, which are used as, as a marketing tool also uh, for, for companies. So WHO is currently working on forthcoming guidelines on these for, uh, for nutrition labeling policies. And maybe just to highlight one, one example, uh, we all, when we think about ingredient lists, we just think about this hard to read bit at the bottom um, of a pack. But actually ingredient lists are, they're, they're the most regulated of, of the four I mentioned. And they also help support implementation of other policies uh, which are relevant for healthy diets. So one example is uh, partially hydrogenated oils. 
can be specified as an ingredient in the ingredient list rather than being grouped under the non-specified definition of hydrogenated oils in general. And that can then help governments eliminate um, industrially produced TFAs and, and uh, support this policy action in the food supply. There are a range of other examples that I thought I would be able to mention, um, but I'll, I'll just uh, start with, uh, for example, the, the health and nutrition claims um, codex, which was mentioned by my colleague Vittorio, uh, set standards, for example, to use the claims like low in sodium uh, or fat-free. Um, but, but one of the challenges there is that there are often no legal frameworks in a country to allow products um, that are unhealthy not to use that claim. So maybe there should be you know, legal frameworks in general that only allow the use of, of any claim or endorsement, even maybe an environmental or sustainability focused endorsement on products with an overall healthy portfolio. So I'll stop here in the interest of time. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. And again, a very um, just uh, opening a little bit of the complexity of, of all this conversation and and, and all, all these organizations are interconnected. And I think you mentioned that for us, maybe at the Q&A, the issue of potential misinformation, right, and the trust that labels uh, and this sense will have to be uh, developed. So thank you so much for these concrete examples. And I would like to invite now uh, Ms. Pilar, and I think it's also connect to you also the FIO. And uh, you can develop a little bit for us how the standards uh, are being shaped, but maybe from the perspective of how they are relevant for the sustainable agri-food systems. I think we talk about nutrition, but there are other dimensions of the importance of this transformation. So Pilar, over to you to share a little bit of your perspective. Thank you, Nicole, and uh, welcome to all the participants. Uh, Yes, <clears throat> effectively, there are some uh, sustainability, they call sustainability standards, which are uh, a set of principle, uh, technical criteria or specification and assurance systems that look for compliance with a specific uh, social, economic, or, uh, and environmental dimension of sustainability. Um, those uh, standards uh, can be, um, or these sustainability, I mean, this dimension of sustainability can be um, accomplished by adopting uh, good practices at the production and also at the uh, supply uh, chain levels. So they are very complementary to the nutrition and, 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 and safety standards. Um, they operate themselves uh, conformity assessment systems to verify and certify <clears throat> that the that good uh, practices are <clears throat> effectively adopted. <clears throat> And in many cases, they um, <clears throat> allow, <clears throat> excuse me, the use of labels uh, to, for, the, for the products to communicate uh, these attributes to the consumers in the marketplaces. So these, uh, these standards have a difference in terms of the relative importance and uh, stringency of those dimensions of sustainability. Uh, some are more focused on, on environmental issues, mainly forestry, agrochemical use, for instance, pesticide use, uh, soil health, and other are more on ethic. Uh, this is the case of Rainforest Alliance, or there are cases more on social and, and, and uh, and ethic issues like, uh, for instance, um, fair trade uh, kind of uh, standards. They are also focused on, some are focused specifically on products, uh, uh, cocoa, uh, coffee, uh, soybean, sugar. Uh, some figures are maybe relevant to mention here uh, on those, the relevance of these standards are, there are over 450 standards uh, internationally used, which is, is a proliferation. Uh, plus other that companies might have themselves. Um, there are over 10 million of producers certified. Uh, of them, uh, about 35% are organic, but the others are, for instance, Rainforest Alliance or Better Cotton. There are also the, the, the nests in the list, which are more important. In terms of um, certified land, there are 85 million hectares certified uh, of, of which, uh, <clears throat> about 72, 73% are organic. So um, it's, it's, not, it's, one, it's, it's one word of, the, of, uh, of these certified products. Uh, and, and the importance is the, what is the, the, the market for the, no, for the recognition of the, of the standard. And, and this is a, a market that is growing slowly in the last 20 or 30 years. 
And at the moment, there are, for instance, uh, seven seven percent of all bananas uh, trade uh, worldwide are certified. Just to give an example. Wow, thank you. So 450 standards and all this, it's indeed very large and takes a, a long time to, uh, and, and, and the whole, so many actors involved because of course the certification and, and different perspectives of, of this conversation. And, and since we have eight minutes left and I, and, and I see that there are questions, it's like good webinars, we are uh, behind the schedule. So uh, I'm, I'm just trying to, I'll pose a, we do have, I have more questions for each of you, but let's try to do a round and uh, think about, because uh, you mentioned uh, we gave an overview, we had already a very strong start with examples, but I think, uh, think moving forward, right? I, Sylvia mentioned so much about, we are, we are gonna gather in July here in Rome for the first ever stock taking moment of food systems transformation. So we are looking for the solutions and this is just part of, of these tools. So maybe we can think, what do you see ahead? What are the challenges that uh, are most uh, important uh, to be tackled in the area? And I think, uh, Vittorio, when we had a conversation, we are also yeah. trying to, yeah, what are the emerging challenges, right? For food standards and ensuring food safety. Uh, uh, I know that you also work on foresight. So maybe you're the one who can <laughs> bring these questions for you. And, and maybe Catherine, uh, uh, we can discuss a little bit of uh, this, uh, again, how do we connect the, the your work to this transition. And then I think this is the question for, I'll start with Victoria and then we do a, a, a final uh, round. And, and if we have two minutes, we can try to get a question, but let me move to you, Victoria. Thanks, thanks, Nicole. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to be very brief, but this is interesting discussion. So maybe, as you said, there will be maybe follow up opportunities to 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 expand on this conversation. I'd like to say that as our agri food system transformed to meet the 2030 agenda, there is a need to develop and maintain a deep understanding of what are the future opportunities ahead of us, as well, of course, what are the, the challenges that we are facing. So in these rapidly changing scenario and world uh, in which we are living in, foresight, I think is more important than ever, as it not predicting that we don't have the crystal ball to predict the future, but it helps us understand what are emerging global drivers and trends that may affect, for example, food safety. And this really helps and supports a more proactive decision-making process so that we don't always come late on issues and we reactive uh, and we are reactive. We try to be a little bit ahead of the game. So um, with respect to food safety, some of the emerging drivers and uh, challenges that we are uh, evaluating <coughs> from the FAO standpoint <coughs> are, for example, of course, issues related to climate change and how climate change is impacting specific food safety hazards. Um, some examples um, are, for example, mycotoxin, which is a um, very well known food safety hazard that affects affects um, staple crops like maize, for example. Well, mycotoxin are uh, highly influenced by climate change and uh, changing weather patterns. So this is something that at FAO we are looking, uh, we are looking very closely. Another one, uh, just to give you another example, it's the in the discourse around increasing environmental sustainability, um, there is increased attention to, for example, a concept like circular economy, which makes a lot of sense in terms of reuse resources. But what what does it mean to food safety? Are we doing the right things when it comes to food safety? So those type of questions are challenging and we need to uh, unpack in this, this kind of complexity in, in, in a very transparent um, way. And maybe just one final example, uh, Nicole, um, again, which is uh, with respect to some of the discussion that goes with mm, looking for new diets and how consumers are changing their behaviors when it comes to food. We see a lot of new food sources coming onto the market it. Um, it's almost every day on, 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 on the media. And so we wanted to also understand what are the opportunities that some of these new foods may bring, of course. At the same time, we also want to understand if there are some issues, potential hazard or even risk that they may pose. We want to be sure that we know and we know them ahead of the game. So I think those are just some quick examples. There will be others, but I think in the interest of time, I'll leave it there and maybe happy to continue in another time. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will have to continue another time. We have four minutes, but I want to give this also the floor to, to Catherine uh, to uh, expand a little bit on this challenge from your perspective. Thank you. Um, I'll try to keep it quick, um, but I think uh, probably what I think is key are, are three elements linked to coherence, compliance, and, and co a comprehensive policy approach. I mean, 
there is a toolbox, yes, but often uh, policies aren't coherent. We, we, we have a starting point, which are dietary guidelines. We know what keeps us as people healthy. We know more or less what keeps the planet healthy, but still the policies that we implement are not always compliant with those foundational recommendations that we have. Uh, so that's that's important. Um, we we need to to focus on compliance. So we have a lot of good tools related to labeling already. Uh, but countries might have policies, but they lack the monitoring for compliance. So focus on on that. Um, but also, I mean, examples that I want to bring, maybe uh, just a couple at the end, are uh, recent laws that are emerging in uh, countries in the the region of the Americas where they have a law to promote healthy diets. It's not only a labeling law or a marketing restriction law, it's a comprehensive law which tackles the issue of, of um, healthy labeling, uh, but also restricting marketing. So the comprehensiveness, ensuring compliance. And, um, and I think those, those are probably the words I'd want to end with in the interest of time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And apologies for rushing us a little bit, but Pilar, your, your final words. <laughs> well, it's very challenging actually in a, in a short time, but um, one of the, I, I might be mentioned some of the, of the main uh, elements of, of, the, of the challenges is one is the, the proliferation of standards. That that's, is really very critical because the, the producers and the different actors get lost in, in this dimension of, of the, the number of standards. The other point is of the, of the evidence base, no? Uh, to prove that effectively these standards are leading to uh, particularly sustainability outcomes. Uh, there are uh, evidence of the adoption of practices with better management, adoption of good practices, but the out, uh, actual outcomes are um, on, on terms of the, uh, for instance, uh, improving the, the soil, improving soil health, etc. they are not clear yet. Um, and the one important point is the market. Uh, if there is not really markets, uh, if the market is, is um, in a certain point uh, saturated with the, with the certified products, then there will not be any more uh, competitive uh, tool uh, for incentivizing the, the sustainable practices. So, and, and finally, um, very much in line with the Mrs. Kunas uh, mentioned before, I mean, it's one of the tools that they should be uh, uh, with other elements, uh, with implemented with other elements in, in, in the policies. Um, it can be a real good incentive if the consumers are engaged in, in, in uh, supporting this kind of, uh, I mean, the, the principles or the values that the, uh, the, the standards transmit uh, through the labels. But then there are a lot of capacity development, policies, extension, investments, uh, a lot of elements that are necessary to uh, make possible, for instance, the, a, a great number of small scale producers, for instance, participate in this market. So wow. we happy <laughs> to continue in another time. We will in the, in the corridors of FIO because I'm the lucky one who can continue posing these questions and uh, they will see me and run to the other side because I, I do have a lot of questions. I'll not have time to read them, but I just want to acknowledge one that is also very important. Maybe that we'll have even other dialogues of how can labeling sustainable foods in small grocery stores help to advance gender equality? Uh, very important point that you see there's so many dimensions, but I want to close because we are really at the top of the hour. Uh, I could not thank you more for being here here, Ms. Kunas, for taking, I know, you know, this busy time. And I, uh, one important thing is, like you said, engaging consumers, right? We need this movement building uh, to promote planetary health through food systems transformation. So I think this uh, allows us to link perfectly well. We're going to have a next conversation, 15th of June, about planetary health. So I would like to end, invite you all for our next conversation. I will send also, uh, and I lived in Berlin before, I have a lot of colleagues there, and we developed a lot of planetary health. So I think the food system is a perfect area to have this. So uh, with that, thank you to our guests, to our technical team, uh, and to the hub. And I'm sure we're going to see you very soon online. Uh, uh, just check our website and we'll be in touch. Thank you so much for your time and uh, important contributions. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>